Hello YouTube. Today I'm going to look at the paradox of tragedy. Um, looked at the paradox of fiction uh, last time, paradox of tragedy today. Um, this paradox arises from two facts. First, we often seek out and appreciate artworks that provoke negative emotions. Uh, second, we tend to avoid things uh, that cause negative emotions. We don't like things that cause negative emotions. Both of these seem to be true, but there's uh, an obvious tension here. Not a paradox, strictly speaking, of course, but you, know, you can see that there is a tension between these two things. The question is, why do we like artworks that cause us to feel sad? I mean, in general, we don't like feeling sad or scared or disgusted or embarrassed. We avoid these feelings, they're not nice. Yet we don't seem to avoid artworks that provoke these feelings. We seek them out. In fact, artworks that cause the most powerful feelings of sadness, or the ones that are the most terrifying, or the comedies that make you cringe the most, um, they're often the ones that we consider to be the best. Um, you know, so why? What's going on here? Uh, so, first of all, I do need to note an, an important clarification. Although this is called the paradox of tragedy, uh, it's not simply concerned with tra tragedy. As I've suggested, it's concerned with all of the negative emotions we might feel in response to an artwork. Sadness, fear, anger, embarrassment, disgust. Uh, Aaron Smuts suggests that this should really be called the paradox of painful art. We're interested in all kinds of negative emotions. But the hist yeah, historically it's called the paradox of tragedy, so that's what I'm calling it. So, um, why do we engage with artworks that provoke these feelings? Well, an intuitive kind of response uh, is given by what are called hedonic compensation theories. And this is what we'll look at in this video. Uh, the basic claim of, of this family of theories is that the unpleasant uh, experiences provoked by these artworks are compensated for, they're outweighed by pleasant experiences that they also provoke. Um, a tragedy may cause us to feel sad, and that's something we'd want to avoid, but it will also uh, evoke other emotions that are pleasant. The unpleasant experience is the price we pay for the pleasant experience. It's sort of like if I say, you can have this chocolate cake, but if so, I'm going to give you a Chinese burn. You might consider that a fair trade. The pleasure of the chocolate cake outweighs the pain of the Chinese burn. So that's the basic idea of hedonic compensation theories, uh, but there are many ways of, of fleshing this out. Um, one of the earliest forms of hedonic compensation theory was given by Aristotle. This is the catharsis theory. According to this theory, artworks provoke unpleasant, unpleasant emotions, but then we derive pleasure from the uh, relief or release of these emotions. We purge unpleasant emotions and this feels pleasurable. It's sort of like, um, you know, a uh, blowing off of steam. If you feel angry, maybe it can help to attack an object like a punching bag. That gets the anger out of your system, and then you feel good. So, the idea behind this theory, and this is undoubtedly true, is that we derive pleasure from the mere cessation of pain. Um, if you're desperately hungry, then pretty much anything will taste good. It, you could be eating the blandest meal ever, it could be like uh, just a bowl of rice or something, but if you're really, really hungry, that's going to feel good because you're relieving the hunger. If you're desperate for a pee, it feels great to pee. It relieves the pain. On this theory, essentially the same thing happens with artworks. They provoke unpleasant experiences, and then it feels good when we're relieved of these experiences. Uh, if you watch a film, you know that you might feel sad for some of the characters, or you might feel pity, uh, or you might feel afraid, but these feelings will end within a particular amount of time. And when those feelings end, this makes you feel good. So. That explains why we seek out artworks that make us feel bad, because we, we know that we'll feel good when the bad feelings are gone. I mean, there are some obvious problems with this theory. Um, first, surely we could do this with many things, not just artworks, but we don't. So going back to the analogies of hunger and urination, um, well, I don't make myself really hungry just for the pleasure of relieving it. I don't hold in peas just for the pleasure of relieving them. Why would I make myself sad just for the pleasure of, you know, relieving the sadness, just for the pleasure of um, not feeling sad afterwards? Usually it's better just to avoid being sad at all. So this maybe doesn't really solve the paradox. Second, 
Don't we enjoy these works while we're engaging with them, not just after? Uh, this theory doesn't seem to capture the uh, sort of phenomenology of our experience of these artworks. It's not that we have a bad feeling, then the feeling goes, then bam, we feel good. Rather, we enjoy the artwork while it's producing the unpleasant feeling, or at least we seem to. Uh, and in any case, do the unpleasant feelings go away when the artwork is over? Some artworks are simply depressing, you know, they, they leave you feeling depressed and there's not really much release at all. I'm sure you've read some books or seen some films that just leave you feeling, you know, just kind of hollow and, and depressed. Um, books about people who've become slaves for years or whatever, just kind of relentlessly, uh, relentlessly tragic and depressing. Similarly, many horror films leave us feeling scared after the film. One of my favourite horror films is Sinister. I watched that very late at night, and I was feeling pretty scared even after it had finished. Um, I usually go downstairs to get food, but that particular night I decided I'd uh, just stay in my room. I didn't want to go downstairs on my own after seeing that film. I was I was too scared. So, what you know, I didn't get any pleasure from the fear going away because it didn't go away. Um, in fact, this, this point actually draws attention to, I think, the biggest problem for catharsis theory, which is that it arguably depends on a very faulty view of psychology. Uh, I suggested that it's like blowing off steam. Like, if you feel angry, you can release the anger by attacking a punching bag. However, at this point, there's actually quite a lot of evidence that this doesn't really work. The, the way to release anger is simply to calm down, sit down and think about something else. If when you get angry you attack a punching bag, actually the, the evidence is that will make you angrier, it will make you more prone to violence. People who have anger problems, the way to deal with that is to break the habit of getting angry and to break the habit of responding with violence. So that the, the sort of psychological claims that motivate the catharsis theory I think are quite questionable. Uh, it's arguable that indulging an emotion is simply not a good way of purging the emotion. It's better just to focus on other things. Um, so, you know, that would, that would then explain exactly why, after we watch a very tragic artwork, we just carry on feeling depressed afterwards. We don't get this sense of, you know, relief from it. Um, so, some problems with that theory, I think. A much more plausible version of the hedonic compensation theory is that the unpleasant feelings are compensated for by intellectual pleasures. Uh, one of the earliest versions of this was suggested by David Hume. According to Hume, we're drawn to artworks that cause unpleasant emotions by the skill and the eloquence of the artist. The very fact that an artist is skilled enough to produce unpleasant feelings is a source of pleasure to us. It's difficult to make people sad or scared or disgusted or embarrassed. Uh, so we take pleasure in the uh, poetic, uh, expressive language used by the author. Um, or the you know narrative of the play that's perfectly structured to, to grip us and build up tension and fear, or the uh, skillful acting of the people on the film. Um, and of course, there are there are many other kinds of intellectual pleasures beyond this that we might appeal to. So uh, tragedy makes us feel sad, but at the same time, uh, we might feel that it allows us to reflect on the human condition. It tells us something important about life, about morality. Um, so, you know, we've got the, this kind of skill of the artist, and then you've got these sort of um, these more kind of abstract reflections that uh, uh, artworks can provoke. Noel Carroll gives an interesting version of, of this in the context of horror. Uh, Carroll suggests that one of the main reasons we love horrors is that the monsters in horror violate our categorical schemes. So what's a categorical scheme? Well, we have uh, our ways of uh, understanding the world. We carve up the world into different things. You know, there are men, there are women, there are trees, cars, mechanical machines, organic plants, oceans, slime, etc. There are all these discrete things in the world. And then there are standard ways that all of these different things relate to each other. You expect to see slime on a slug, but not in a computer. You see hooves on a horse, but not on a man. According to Carroll, the monsters of horror will, uh, will violate our categories, our ways of dividing up the world. And this naturally produces fear or disgust. You know, it produces a negative reaction because it's, it's weird, it's unfamiliar, you know. But it also triggers our curiosity for exactly the same reason. It's weird, it's unfamiliar. So we, we get this curiosity about it. And what really draws us to monsters in horror 
uh, according to Carroll, is not that they're, they're physically threatening, but that they're cognitively threatening. They're strange, they're outside what we understand the natural order to be. They violate our categories. So consider werewolves. Werewolves combine the usually distinct categories of man and wolf. Zombies combine living and dead. The alien from uh, the alien films is uh, a combination of highly mechanical features with sort of sliminess and other organic features. Um, so in horror, uh, categories that clash are forced together. Or you can take a particular thing and, and kind of alter it in a certain way. So um, you have like giant spiders, you know, uh, this is um, a perfectly normal thing but blown up to an unusual size. Um, the giant uh, brain bug at the end of Starship Troopers that's sort of gross and slimy and sticks that thing in your head and sucks out your brains. That's like a combination of various bugs blown up to an unusual size. We find these things scary and disgusting. But the same properties that produce that reaction also trigger our curiosity. And horror appeals to us because you know, satisfying curiosity feels pleasurable. When we engage with a horror artwork, we learn about a new monster. We learn about its properties. You know, how was it made or how is it summoned? Uh, we learn what, what does it do, what does it want? We learn about its weaknesses, you know, how we can deal with it. So there's this, this process of learning and discovery that produces great pleasure. And we follow the characters as they engage in, in this discovery. I suppose an analogue to this would be, um, imagine that you're scared of snakes, but at the same time you find them exotic and interesting. You might be tempted to hold a snake, despite your fear, so you can see what it feels like and how it behaves. Um, and I suppose also one of the benefits of this theory is that it explains why we're so critical of horror stories that don't explain the monster properly. Uh, you know, the horror stories that aren't believable. We all know horror stories that set up a great mystery, but the payoff is disappointing. This is because these stories don't adequately realise the, uh, the process of discovery and learning that we expect from horror. I think the, the intellectual pleasures theory is fairly powerful. Um, I mean, it, it must be at least part of the answer. There's, there's no question that intellectual pleasures are among the things that draw us to painful artwork. Um, and it's also very comprehensive. As we've seen, it accounts for, uh, for tragedies, for horror films, for comedies that make us cringe. I'll just note a couple of problems. First, we might wonder if it's quite comprehensive enough. Um, we might say, you know, there are artworks we like that produce negative emotions, but they don't really afford any kind of intellectual pleasure. Um, maybe sappy romance stories, for instance, or some, you know, base comedies, shock films that just try to produce disgust, like Pink Flamingos. I've never actually seen Pink, Pink Flamingos, by the way, um, but I'm aware that it's kind of considered extremely lowbrow and base, but it has a big cult following. Um, maybe there's not much talent or creativity involved in these things. I suppose this is actually a fairly snobbish kind of point. It's not one that I'm inclined to make because I'm a kind of total anti-snob. Uh, I would respond to this, that if an artwork has produced a powerful emotion in you, you know, and it's an artwork that you enjoy and that you want to go back to, that takes talent. There's got to be some you know, there's got to be some intellectual pleasures there. The skill of the artist or the violation of categorical schemes or it allows you to reflect on something, you know, it's, there's got to be some of that involved. Um, but some people might make this criticism. Uh, a more serious difficulty for the intellectual pleasures account is that these same intellectual pleasures can be afforded by artworks that don't produce negative emotions. If it's about admiring the skill of the artist, why not just engage with artworks that provoke joy or laughter? That requires just as much skill. Regarding Carol's point about monsters, there are things that violate our categorical schemes but that don't scare or disgust us. You know, just, just watch some light-hearted fantasy movies. Unicorns violate our categorical schemes without producing the negative emotions. So it's questionable to what extent the intellectual pleasures theory actually answers the paradox. If we want to support this theory, we need to show... Um, what we need to show is that artworks that in invoke negative emotions provide some kind of intellectual pleasure that can't be produced by artworks that don't invoke negative emotions. And I'm not sure we could really come up with a comprehensive theory that actually does that. The meta-response theory is suggested by Susan Fagin. Um, actually, I'm not sure how to pronounce that name. Is it Fagin or Fagin or, uh, you know, what, what is it? I, I don't know. 
Um, but Feigin, uh, I'll call her that, draws a distinction between direct responses to artworks and meta responses. She says uh, a direct response is a response to the qualities and content of the work. A meta response is a response to the direct response. I think this is fairly simple. We have responses to things uh, and we can have responses to those responses. For instance, suppose you see a small child fall off his bike uh, and it amuses you. This is a direct response. But being a kind person, you feel bad about the fact that you're amused. You know, a small child has just hurt himself. That shouldn't be funny. So you feel guilty. The guilt is a meta response, a response to your direct response. With this, we have a simple answer to the paradox. When you watch Game of Thrones, your direct response is sadness for Sansa. But the sadness of the direct response is outweighed by the pleasure of your meta response. So we have an unpleasant direct response of sadness, then we have a pleasant meta response to this sadness. Um, according to Fagin, we find ourselves to be the kind of people who respond negatively to villainy, treachery and injustice. This discovery or reminder is something which, quite justly, yields satisfaction. That's a quote from her. Um, so we see Joffrey abusing Sansa, and this makes us very sad. But the fact that we feel sad, um, that we feel sad about this, reminds us that we're good people. You know, we're moral. We care for others. We wouldn't, um, uh, we wouldn't, whoops, we wouldn't uh, behave like Joffrey. Furthermore, we know that other people are also feeling sad for Sansa. We share the sadness, and this reminds us of our common humanity. We're united by our care for Sansa and our hatred for Joffrey. It's these responses that bring us pleasure. I feel sad, which is unpleasant, but then reflecting on the sadness, I think to myself, oh, what a good person I am. I'm such a sensitive man, and this feels good. Of course, there's an immediate worry here. You know, if you watch a tragedy and the reason you enjoy it is that it makes you think, you know, oh, what a good and sensitive and moral person I am, that kind of sounds very disingenuous and self-absorbed. I mean, surely a genuinely sensitive and moral person wouldn't be going around complimenting themselves on how wonderful they are. But Feigin says, no, um, you know, the feelings of sadness and pity for tragic characters are important. You know, these are feelings that are at the very foundations of morality. Um, they, they bring humanity together. So naturally, we find them to be of great worth. There's nothing wrong with feeling good about the fact that you have such feelings. You should feel good about that. Fagin points out that this theory accounts for why we favour tragedy over comedy. Apparently, a lot of people feel that tragic artworks are in some sense more worthwhile than comedies. You know, comedy is baser and more lowbrow and tragedy is weightier. Um, Fagan says that we feel this way because tragedy is better placed to evoke uh, those feelings that are at the foundation of morality. It's, uh, it's better placed to produce these kinds of meta-responses. Comedy rarely involves meta-responses, so tragedy gives us something that comedies don't. Um, I find this point fairly snobbish, to be honest. Um, I mean, it's definitely true that a lot of people find comedy less valuable. You get this a lot online, you know, on film forums and stuff, people disvaluing comedy. Um, I don't agree with that at all. Many of my favourite artworks are comedies. Um, it always comes across to me as very humorless and narrow-minded when people disparage comedies in this way. Uh, it's fine if you don't like comedy, you know, if it's just not to your taste, fine. But uh, when you get people who are like, you know, yeah, comedy, that's for the common people. I like serious art that deals with serious things. Just go away, you know. With that said, uh, Fagin is maybe onto something here. I mentioned that one of the problems with the intellectual pleasures account is that um, an artwork doesn't have to provoke negative emotions in order for you to, say, admire the skill of the artist or in order for it to violate your categorial schemes. Purely positive artworks can do both of these things as well. So one big point in favour of the meta-response theory is that arguably, in order for an artwork to provoke the appropriate meta-responses, it would have to provoke negative emotions. To have meta-responses about morality, about how sensitive you are, uh, you know, about how you share that sensitivity with others, to have those responses, um, you need to see people behaving immorally. You need to see people in bad positions. You need to feel sadness and pity. There are some important meta-responses that you just wouldn't have unless you felt things like sadness and pity. 
So the meta response theory really does offer a, a solution. It says, well, here's something that tragedy gives us that non-tragic artworks can't give us. So that's why we seek out tragedy. Um, some problems for the meta response theory. First, why does it need to be a meta response? Why couldn't we just sit and think about our moral views and directly feel good about them? Um, I mean, as I just explained, bad feelings like sadness and pity are necessary for certain meta responses. If I want to have a meta response of the form, I'm such a sensitive guy, I need to feel something like pity for some, someone. But, but what's so special about the meta response of I'm such a sensitive guy? I can just think that directly. Uh, I, I, I can uh, sit on an armchair and consider the moral attitudes I have. I don't need to watch a tragedy to do this. I suppose Fagin could say, well, you know, the benefit of tragic artwork is that it provides concrete and often detailed examples of things to feel sad about, for people to feel pity for. When you engage with a fiction, you get the kind of detail that you'd have in real life. You know, it's, it's not like merely trying to think about things for yourself. Um, and also fiction provides novel examples. It provides cases you probably wouldn't have been able to come up with yourself. Um, and because they can be so detailed, it can flesh out all the context and so on. Um, so I suppose that's a, a plausible response there. Second, what about the many cases where we root for the villains, or at least characters that we would normally consider villainous? Sometimes uh, we root for people that the story presents as villainous. Um, I've mentioned in previous videos that I root for people like uh, Tywin Lannister, Peter Baelish and Ramsay Bolton in, in Game of Thrones. I like the, the evil bastards. In some other cases, stories will present as good people we would ordinarily consider villainous. Just think of some crime films where the criminal is the protagonist. In these cases, when the villain dies, um, we will have a direct response of sadness, but this won't produce the right meta-response. This guy's a villain. I know he's a villain. I wouldn't like him if he was a real person. I don't want real people to behave like him. I don't feel sympathy for real people like him. So I wouldn't have a good meta-response to the sadness I feel when he dies. Feigen kind of mentions this problem. She explicitly says that on the meta-response theory, judging a work of art to be good depends on having moral approval of it. Because if you don't morally approve of the characters, you know, if a story presents somebody as a hero, but you consider that person to be bad, you won't have the right meta-response when bad things happen to them. You know, you'll be sad, but you won't feel good about feeling sad. Now, Feigen actually considers this to be a benefit of her theory, but I think it's a problem, because, in fact, we do root for the villains. Um, and I don't think, in general, we, we need to morally approve of an artwork in order to get a great deal of enjoyment from it. In fact... In general, many great works of art produce confused moral responses. One of my all-time favourite films is Blade Runner, the final cut. There are many versions of Blade Runner. Um, there's like the original director's cut, a um, bunch of other versions. Uh, I like the final cut. And one of my favourite scenes ever in all of cinema is, is Roy Batty's death scene, the tears in rain scene. So uh, evocative and powerful and moving. It's an extremely sad scene. Now, is Roy Batty a good person? Well, he's certainly not a hero in any traditional sense. No one in Blade Runner is a hero in any traditional sense. The whole film is sort of full of moral ambiguities. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make me think about how good I am, about how sensitive I am. If anything, it just confuses me. It, um, it leaves me feeling morally unsettled. It's not obvious what to think about it. And the point is, this is one of the main things that makes it such an incredible film. Very few artworks really commit themselves to moral ambiguity like Blade Runner does. Um, and I'm not sure that the meta-response theory can really capture cases like this. I mean, I certainly do have meta-responses to Blade Runner. Roy Batty's death makes me feel sad, and then I have a meta-response to that sadness. But the meta-response doesn't feel good, it just feels confused and unsettled. So, you know, again, this is a negative emotion. The paradox of tragedy has arisen again at the meta-response level. So I think this this is perhaps a serious problem for Feigin's theory. Third, why don't we have these meta-responses in real life as well, and so end up enjoying real tragedies? If I see a train crash, I, I might feel bad for the people who've died. Why don't I then have the meta-response, you know, oh, I'm so good and moral because I pity for these people, you know, and so end up enjoying the train crash? Feigin mentions this objection, and I, I think she has a reasonable response. She says, well, you know, 
In artworks, nobody really suffers. In reality, there's real suffering. So our sympathy comes at too great a cost uh, f you know, for a positive meta-response. Yeah, a positive meta-response would be inappropriate. Um, we know that our sympathy for, towards real people is a product of or depends on real misery. In real life, it's more appropriate to feel good about what we do rather than what we feel. Um, but in fictions, of course, you know, we can't make any changes and there'll be no need to make any changes. Fictional worlds aren't real, so it doesn't matter what we do with respect to them, even if we could do something with respect to them, which we can't. Um, so having these meta responses is perfectly fine. Incidentally, this is not to say that meta responses are never appropriate in real life. Uh, we already mentioned one which is, we feel guilty about being amused that the child has hurt himself. Um, the point is that uh, positive meta responses um, in response to you know, feeling sympathy for real suffering are not appropriate. The main problem for uh, meta response theory is that it's just sort of too intellectual. It's too detached. Um, the fact is, we very often simply feel for the characters. We're not thinking about anything else. A good fiction is one that draws you in. Generally speaking, if you're enjoying a good fiction, you're not thinking about yourself. Just, you know, recall your own experience here. How often, when you, you're reading a riveting book that's making you feel really sad, how often are you reflecting on what a good person you are? You know, in fact, when an artwork makes you think about yourself and your own reactions, well, arguably, you're paying less attention to the artwork. Your mind has wondered, and that's not something that we look for. That would suggest the artwork is boring, it's not holding our attention. Um, so, I would say that's the main, the main difficulty here, is it just doesn't... The meta-response theory just does not seem to capture the actual phenomenology of engaging with uh, these kinds of art. It's also worth noting that um, this theory isn't really plausible for emotions like fear or disgust or embarrassment. It only really works with uh, sadness and pity. When a horror film scares you, you're not going to be thinking, you know, oh, what a wonderful person I am. I'm terrified of ghosts. If I were in their situation, I'd pee myself and run away. Aren't I fantastic? Um, that's, that's not going to work. Um, so... Some problems there, even if meta-response theory is plausible in some cases, I, I, it can't be a, a comprehensive answer. Alright then, so, um, the power theory. According to the power theory, painful artworks give us feelings of power, and this is why we seek them out. Now one case where we do definitely experience feelings of power and superiority is with cringe-worthy comedies that produce embarrassment and awkwardness. Embarrassment and awkwardness are painful, but it's not us in the embarrassing, awkward situations. We feel better than the characters. We're laughing or cringing at their misfortune. So, you know, in those cases, arguably, we do have feelings of power. But what about when we experience, you know, sadness, fear, disgust? In what sense do they provoke uh, a sense of power? One possibility here is to suggest a kind of endurance theory. Um, artworks that provoke very powerful feelings of fear, sadness, disgust, are difficult to watch. So if we can bear them, we can prove to ourselves that we're strong enough to do so. We're not going to let those feelings win. We're going to face them head on and sit through them. And there's no doubt that people do this kind of thing. Uh, this is a video on YouTube. It shouldn't take you too long to search around YouTube and find uh, videos of people doing endurance cha challenges, you know, people eating obscenely hot chilli peppers, people chugging loads of milk, um, people, I don't, I don't know, stapling their tongues or whatever. Um, a plausible explanation for why people choose to do this kind of endurance thing is that it provides feelings of power. It's a way of saying, I'm strong enough to do this. So here's a quote from uh, Friedrich Nietzsche concerning tragedy. Um, a preference for questionable and terrifying things is a symptom of strength. It is the heroic spirits who say yes to themselves in tragic cruelty. They are hard enough to experience suffering as pleasure. It is a sign of one's feeling of power and well-being how far one can acknowledge the terrifying and questionable character of things. It takes strength to suffer through a painful tragedy or a terrifying horror. We derive pleasure from our own strength. So this would be providing a sense of individual power, 
But painful artworks can also uh, provoke a more communal sense of power. In the context of tragedy, uh, Amy Price suggests that we can take pleasure in the sort of endurance of humanity, uh, the ability of humans to overcome great odds. Uh, now, this doesn't necessarily mean that they're successful. Maybe the hero fails, maybe he's even killed by the end of the story. The point is that despite the tragic events that happen to him, we can see that he's lived a life of great virtue. He's done many admirable things. Humans endure suffering and endure tragedy, and yet we can still affirm life and embrace life. We see that humans are the kinds of creatures who can realise great value, even in the face of great adversity. A similar point can be made for horror stories. You feel fear or disgust towards the monster, but you also see humans resisting it. Often the humans will beat it, but as with tragedies, you know, sometimes they fail. What's important is that you see humans band together. You see humans express resistance and power, whether or not they ultimately win. Incidentally, in, in the context of horror, Daniel Shaw points out that often we might actually temporarily be on the side of the monster. You've all encountered horror stories where many of the characters are complete idiots. They do really stupid things and put themselves in obviously dangerous situations. Shaw says, you know, we want these idiots to die. These people make us angry. We admire the monster as it picks them off. These characters exhibit a weakness, the weakness of idiocy, and this allows us to feel a sense of power and superiority over them. You know, I, I say to myself, well, I wouldn't do what this moron is doing. He deserves to die for being so stupid. So even when we feel fear or disgust towards the monster, uh, we also feel pleasure to see it kill the idiots, and we then feel pleasure from the, the sort of sense of power when we see the more intelligent humans resisting it. Um, so that's kind of power theory. The main problems with this theory, uh, well, first of all, it's arguably rather morally suspect. Is it right to watch characters suffer in order to experience these feelings of power over them? That sounds a bit dodgy. I mean, if you were to do that in real life, if you were to watch videos of starving children in Africa just to be reminded of your own strength, um, well, nobody would want to be around a person who, who does that, you know. Uh, so, is it, it maybe some moral questions uh, are raised by this theory. I suppose the power theorists could respond, well, you know, this is kind of... You know, the point is, we're not talking about real tragedies, we're talking about artworks. The fact that it's fictional that it's not real, this is what makes it okay to have these feelings. And actually, as I mentioned earlier, I myself will often root for the villains. Um, it's okay to root for fictional villains precisely because they're fictional, they're not really hurting anyone. Similarly, it's okay to have these feelings of power because it's, it's just uh, fiction. Second, and more importantly, this just doesn't seem to be true to our experiences of painful artworks. As I noted, um, it seems to capture some cases like cringeworthy comedies, but applying it to horror stories and especially tragedies just seems very strained to me. Uh, we all know what power feels like. We've all had times where uh, we've, uh, I don't know, bested someone in an argument. Um, we've all tried out one of those endurance things. Can you take the pain of this hot chilli pepper? Can you drink this disgusting concoction of milk and Pepsi and mustard that I've just made? Um, that's just not how we feel after watching a depressing tragedy. There's a, there's, you know, there's a big difference between the kinds of feelings we have after watching, uh, after engaging with a tragedy, and the feeling of kind of power and superiority over others. Um, so I think it's, I, I don't find this very plausible, just considering your, you, you know, one's own experience of these things. So those were hedonic compensation theories. There's a general advantage for all of these theories. They explain why some people have to leave the cinema or close the book, um, you know, because it becomes too sad or too scary, even when they're enjoying it. The negative emotion has become intense enough that the positive emotion no longer compensates for it. For, for those of us who stay and watch, it's not that we're so callous that we don't feel sad for the characters in these terrible situations. Rather, the positive experience, experiences afforded by the artwork outweigh the sadness and the pity. Um, so this sort of theory um, plausibly explains why some people, even if they're enjoying an artwork, sometimes just have to stop. And it also um, you know, makes those of us who you know, maybe like watching tragic artworks, uh, we don't have to say that we're just kind of 
evil bastards who enjoy watching people suffer or whatever. Actually, I suppose power theory does say that, but um, but you know the other the other hedonic compensation theories don't. Um, but there's also a general problem for these theories. There seem to be many cases where it looks like what we seek out is specifically the negative experience rather than any compensating positive experience. Now, undoubtedly, any artwork that we enjoy is almost certainly going to produce positive experiences. Uh, a book might have a tragic ending that makes you feel sad, but you'll enjoy the poetic language, the clever narrative structure, the detail of the characters. If an artwork didn't produce any positive experiences, we'd just think it was rubbish. The question is, though, is it really true that the sadness is the price we pay for these positive experiences? Is the sadness something we have to bear until the positive experiences compensate for it? I think the answer to this is obviously no. Part of what we seek out is, is the sadness itself, not some other feelings that will be produced by the sadness or that occur at the same time as the sadness. The sadness itself is part of what we seek. I mean, the way to see this is to imagine a genie were to come down and say, uh, OK, when you read Lord of the Rings, your experience will be exactly the same, except there'll be no more sadness when people die. When you watch Sinister, everything will be exactly the same, except there'll be no fear. You won't find it scary. When you watch Alien, everything will be exactly the same, except you won't find the creature in it disgusting. Would we agree to this? Would we think this was a good deal? I don't think many people would. But if the hedonic compensation theory is right, we should do, because then we'd like these films even more. Uh, at the moment, our experience is, the, the experience is that we have negative experiences, then we have these positive experiences that outweigh the negative ones. That's, as, that's what our experiences is like at the moment, according to hedonic compensation theory. So if we were to remove the negative experience, it would be even better overall. If we could remove the sadness, remove the fear, remove the disgust, it would be even better. The fact that we wouldn't want this, I think most of us actually would uh, object to this very strongly, suggests that hedonic compensation theory doesn't really capture why we seek out artworks that provoke negative emotions. If we lost those negative emotions, something very important would be lost. So we're not just kind of bearing the negative emotions for the sake of some positive stuff. That's just not how it works. So it might be worth trying to explore theories that, that don't try to resolve the paradox by appealing to positive experiences that outweigh the negative ones. Um, and that is exactly what we will do in the next video, but uh, I've covered enough for today. So goodbye.